Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I will introduce uh, Lars Osberg in a moment. I wanted to first say a few things about um, what we're going to talk about today. So I'm Christine Saunier, Nova Scotia Director of the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, at CCPANS for short. I'm joined today by Dr. Lars Osberg, McCulloch Professor of Economics at Dalhousie University and a research associate of CCPA. So just adjusting audio, hoping that uh, you can hear us okay. So is this where I say hi? Not yet, Lars. Hold on. <laughs> okay, I think. Um, just checking to make sure that people can hear okay. Okay, I'm going to say a few words and then I will hand it over to you, um, Lars. So uh, last Friday, uh, Statistics Canada released the labor force survey. So the data that's reflected in that survey looks at labor market conditions for the week of April 12th to April 18th. By that point, the COVID-19 economic shutdown was fully implemented in all provinces and territories in Canada. And to be clear, we understand this to be absolutely necessary because, of course, we are in a pandemic. But before we get into the Nova Scotia numbers, I thought I'd give you just a brief overview of uh, the national numbers and then uh, Lars will walk us through the Nova Scotia numbers. Uh, nationally, we, uh, the last survey showed us that 3 million Canadians lost their jobs but another 2.5 million had a majority of their hours cut. That means 5.5 million Canadians lost work or a majority of their hours since February. That represents 29% of all workers. Now there's a note there that the labor force survey does not include the self-employed. And when we look a little deeper into who those workers are nationally, we see that uh, two in five of those workers are youth, that is aged 15 to 24. And half of those workers were making under $16 an hour. This compares to only 1% of jobs lost or hours cut among the richest 10% of workers. That's those who make more than $48 an hour. The national numbers show us that workers who have lost their jobs have tended to be the lowest wage, non-unionized hourly workers, who tend to have less security and less access to benefits, and that more women have lost their jobs. Now, this analysis actually comes from CCPA's senior economist in Ottawa, David McDonald. You can find his full analysis on our blog site. That's www.behindthenumbers.ca. If you are interested in hearing more about the national picture, David is hosting a question and answer on his own uh, with CCPA National at 1 p.m. That's 1 p.m. Atlantic time, so uh, in about an hour, just after we're finished. Our target today is uh, to finish this webinar by, by uh, quarter to one, so 45 minutes. Uh, we will put the link for David McDonald's. Uh, he's doing it on YouTube, so there'll be a link to that YouTube link. And actually, I want to thank Govid Rayo, who is monitoring uh, Facebook for us today. He will actually put the link in there for you if you'd like to hear more about the national numbers. But just to give you a little overview, that's what we're looking at nationally in terms of the impact of COVID on workers. And now I am actually going to turn it over to Lars. Okay. Let's start your video. And now. Am I, can you hear me now? I can hear you, but can't see you yet. 
my machine says uh, that I should start my video. Yes. Okay. There you are. Oh, okay. There I am. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. We can so see. do we have do we have a bunch of people uh, signed on, or are we just talking to each other? Nope. There's uh, we're on Facebook Live, so there'll be people watching from there. We just can't see them. You can't see them on oh. your Zoom, but there are people. Oh, I can't see them. Well, That's right, right. But they're there. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, um, I guess the the the, the key thing that that, that I would uh, focus on. Uh, and it's true for Nova Scotia, and as it's true for Canada as a whole, as it's true for most of the, or all of the, the rich countries of, of the world, uh, or, or indeed all the countries of the world, is, is this is re really unprecedented uh, in terms of its economic impact. Uh, I'm uh, old enough to have, uh, have, have seen a whole bunch of recessions by now. Of the early 80s was a really steep, oh, a steep one. The, the early 90s was, was a, a deep and long recession, had a lot of major impacts. Then we had the 2008-2009 the recession, which was the biggest one uh, since uh, the Great Depression of, of the 1930s. And, and, and this, this uh, recession is, is bigger than, than all of them. It, it's, uh, the International Monetary Fund uh, already labels it as such. The Bank of England uh, t talks about this being the, the worst recession in, in 300 years. Uh, the, the speed, the severity, and the synchronization of this uh, re recession around the world uh, is just ha hasn't been, been seen before. Uh, so there are differences within the, the, the impact of the recession, but they're, they're a little bit like which bedroom in the house is getting burned down first when the house is on fire? Uh, the you know, and in normal times, we, we we might if we're all living in the same house, we might worry about whose bedroom is biggest and who who gets the better view and that, those sorts of things. But when the house as a whole is burning, that's that's the main event. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, I'm. I know we're, we're talking about uh, the Nova Scotia uh, uh, numbers here. Uh, in many respects, uh, they, they mirror the, uh, the national numbers. Uh, a, a little difference here and there, a, a difference that we might think to be big enough to be significant in, in normal times, but in, in these times, the big difference is the difference between f February and April, uh, not really the differences between different types of people or different locations of people in, in April. Um, now, uh, the, some, some aspects uh, of, of this recession are, are, are similar to, to, uh, to other recessions. In recessions, it's always uh, the, the low paid uh, who get hammered first, first and most. Uh, that's even more so uh, uh, this time. Uh, the decline in uh, work hours for people uh, making less than $15 an hour is like 50% of work hours. That, that's a number that you just don't see uh, in, in, I mean, in two months. Uh, so so, so the, the, this is much more severe on the, on the low or lower paid uh, than, than uh, previous re recessions. It, it's always the, the hourly paid who, who take the hit not the salaried, uh, uh, but that's even more so uh, th this time uh, with the added wrinkle that many salaried people uh, are find suddenly that they can work from home. So uh, the recession is, is and COVID-19 is anxiety producing. It's, it's totally turning our lives upside down, but it's not affecting your paycheck, uh, particularly if you can continue to work from home and continue to, to draw a salary. That's just not true. Uh, for the people who, for the, as you say, the 5.5 million who uh, have lost all or most of, of their work hours within the space of, of two months. Now, to remind, uh, back in February, we were talking about uh, an official unemployment rate of 5.6%. Uh, 
which I personally consider to be too, too high, uh, but it was low compared to, to what Canadians had learned to experience over the last uh, 20 and 30 odd years. Uh, when, when the unemployment rate is, is in that region, there isn't that much difference between the official unemployment rate and what we can call the supplementary unemployment rate. Because in order to count it officially, not only do you have to have no, not have a job, but you have to actively look for, for a job. Uh, now, if, if, there, if you know perfectly well that there aren't any jobs out there, then it's kind of a waste of time and a waste of effort to, to go looking for them. Uh, so there's a big difference today between uh, the what they call the supplementary unemployment rate and the official unemployment rate. There, there wasn't much of a difference back in that February, the supplementary unemployment rate, which counts people who have worked recently, who want to work, but haven't actually looked for work, uh, was 5.9%. The official unemployment rate was 5.6%. So, so, so not a big difference back in February. But when you have a cratering of the economy like we've had now, it really doesn't make a lot of sense for you to, people to go looking for work uh, that isn't there. I mean, the em employment in, in the restaurant sector has, has disappeared by like half. People, you know, there's no point really in knocking on a door that you know is closed. So the supplementary unemployment rate has gone up by far more than the official unemployment rate. The official unemployment rate went to, now I have the number here, 13%. Uh, that, that's a, a gargantuan increase in, in just two months. But the supplementary unemployment rate went from 5.9% to 17.8%. That's tripling, tripling in, in the space of two months. That's those sorts of, of numbers, that sort of magnitude, just hasn't been seen. You know, it's 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 this is this is absolutely dramatic stuff. So, although the, the, the numbers are a little bit different in Nova Scotia on those dimensions, it, that that's really not the the main event. The main event is that you've had a, a tripling of the unemployment rate in just two months. Now, now there, there, there's also some some differences uh, by 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 gender. Uh, this is a bit different uh, from from say the 2008 2009 recession because uh, you know normally speaking in, in a in a recession it usually starts in in financial markets. Uh, there, there there was a, a banking crisis back in 2008 2009. The recessions before that were policy induced by the Bank of Canada. It raised interest rates, and so. What normally happens in a recession is interest rates go up a little bit uh, and then people decide not to buy a, that house, they don't decide not to buy that car. There are these interest rate sensitive sectors which tend to be employ more men than women. So there's a bit more of a hit typically to male employment initially than to female employment. But this time, uh, it's very much the, the, the services sector that's getting hit first and hardest. Uh, and uh, those are, are, are sectors which employ a more balance, uh, in, they're more balanced male, male female, uh, uh, often more, a little bit predominantly female, like in the restaurant sector. Uh, so this, uh, this recession has affected w women a bit more than it has, uh, has men. But that's kind of a small thing compared to a tripling of the unemployment rate in, uh, in just two months. I mean, if the absolute impact by gender is, where, where do I have it over here? It's like 2.7 million women and like 2, or 2.6 million men or something like that. But the, the key thing is those are millions of people who've lost their job uh, within in two months. There's a, a little bit of a, a difference there, uh, male, female, but the big thing is just an enormous loss of employment. So I guess I've been rambling on for a bit. Uh, what's, what, what, what do we do go, where do we go from here? Do we hand, ask for questions? 
Uh, we did have a question come in, and in fact, it's come in also via email, very similar question, and it was about the, the gender question. So uh, we understand that more women have uh, lost their jobs or majority of their hours, and so you've talked about that nationally, assuming that those numbers look very similar in Nova Scotia. Yeah, um, they do. Are there implications as, as our governments think about quote unquote reopening the economy uh, given some of the trends that you're talking about and including the gender and you know when, when we think about, about we're talking to, today about the about the, the un, unemployment and people who have lost their their jobs we we shouldn't also so forget that covid 19 has had a, a gendered impact on the people who have kept their jobs, uh, 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 deemed essential workers in the healthcare sector and, and for, for example, take uh, um, uh, keeping the, the grocery sector uh, rolling. Uh, so uh, the people who are exposed to, uh, to um, a greater risk of, of COVID-19. Uh, there's been a lot of evidence uh, coming out of the U.S., particularly uh, of a highly racialized, highly gendered uh, impact of of the of COVID nineteen on the service sector workers who have been exposed to it. Uh, I guess we're focusing today on unemployment and, and the loss of, of, of jobs. And you know, I, I, I'm I'm not saying that the the, the, the gendered nature of the impact is, isn't important, but when, when you've got a tripling of the unemployment rate uh, in in two months five and a half million people in total uh, losing all or most of their work, work hours. Uh, 28% uh, of the employed population, you know, that, that's, that's the, the main event. Thanks, Lars. Um, uh, yes, and thanks for, for talking about, of course, those who are employed and uh, actually probably working more than they had previously, including some of the workers that you talked about. Uh, and, and of course, uh, some of the work that's happening inside the home at the same time as there's no uh, schooling and childcare and et cetera. So add that on to everything. And, and there is a, a gender dimension to all of that as well. You know, stats haven't changed that much around uh, who's doing that work, but I guess one of the questions we're getting is really, can you, I know you have them there, but, and without overwhelming people with numbers, can you give the, the Nova Scotia, so you talked about gargantuan increases, those were the national numbers. What are we, what are we talking about in Nova Scotia, if you can? Okay, for, for Nova Scotia, and uh, you'll, you'll have to pardon me because I'm, I'm looking at my, at another computer That's screen okay. as, I, as I talk to you. Uh, Total total employment. Well, we're, we're so much smaller as a, as a province uh, that when we, we had a fifteen percent uh, drop in fifteen percent of jobs were completely lost. Uh, but we, all, in addition to the seventy thousand jobs that were completely lost, uh, about uh, about uh, forty six thousand jobs. It's not that they, the people didn't still, in a nominal sense, have the jobs, it's they just don't have any work hours. Uh, in addition, 7,500 uh, people lost 50% uh, or more of their work, work hours in Nova Scotia. That's 122,000 people who are like 26.7% of the people who were employed um, back in, in February. And that's pretty close to the national number, which is 28.9%. So we were just a hair mm -hmm. less uh, impact in, in, Nova, in Nova Scotia. Uh, and, and the unemployment, uh, the official unemployment rate uh, went from 8.7 to 13% in, 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 Nova, in Nova Scotia. I, I really don't think that's uh, that that's uh, it fits the reality of a recession. Uh, it, the in a, in a recession, in this recession, the same as two thousand eight, two thousand nine, the supplementary unemployment rate went up way more than the official unemployment rate for the very good reason that uh, people. Well, what's the point in looking hard for for a job or doing, when you know there isn't one? 
the one available. Uh, now, in Nova Scotia, the supplementary unemployment rate uh, was 9% back in February, and it rose to 18%. That's just a hair more than the 17.8% uh, na national. Uh, so uh, now, again, we're talking about uh, an, a supplementary unemployment rate that's pretty close to the official unemployment rate. It doesn't make much difference. You know, when, when you know there are jobs out there, you, it, it makes sense to look for one, look for them if you if you want one. Uh, so there isn't there wasn't much difference back in uh, in February, but there is a huge uh, five five percentage point difference uh, in, uh, in, uh, in 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 April. And and the, the thing that we that we, we sh should be thinking about is that you know this thing isn't over yet uh, by any means, uh, and. A, a whole bunch of employers have been kind of hanging on, uh, thinking that maybe this will be a month or two uh, kind of event. But as their bills accumulate and, and firms go out of business, there are going to be employment losses continuing uh, for some some time to come. Uh, so, so in, in that sense, uh, the the uh, numbers in Nova Scotia. Well, they, they they differ a little bit in the sense that Nova Scotia is is a more uh, rural province uh, than uh, as a percentage to of total employment than uh, say Ontario or, or or Quebec, but for for just d decades and decades now, uh, the Halifax uh, labor market, which is about a little under half uh, of employment in Nova Scotia, uh, it has been you know a mid-sized Canadian uh, city. Uh, relatively low unemployment uh, compared to many other Can Canadian cities. Uh, the difference between Nova Scotia uh, and uh, and other other provinces in sort of average unemployment or the labor force participation rate or whatever is really in in the rural areas of, of the province, and uh, the provincial average is typically higher than many other provinces in terms of unemployment rate because there. Uh, because there's a higher a fraction of the population that lives outside uh, the major metro area of of Halifax, uh, and it's that the difference is is not just uh, in the uh, in, in the official unemployment rate; it's also in the people who who don't look for work because it's they live in a small town. They know perfectly well uh, who's hiring and who isn't, and so they they don't look for work because there really isn't a lot of point. Uh, and so the official unemployment rate understates uh, the availability of labor and the, and the real unemployment rate, particularly strongly in the rural areas of Nova Scotia. Um, and, uh, and of course, there, there's a, a different industrial comp composition of employment, which has a seasonal dimension. Uh, we're heading into what we in normal years would have thought of as being the, the tourism uh, uh, season. And it's entirely unclear wh where those jobs are going to be. Well, I guess it's becoming dismally too clear uh, wh what's going to happen to those jobs this summer. Thanks, Lars. We do have uh, questions coming in, and and per and you're I think starting to answer some of them and talking about rural versus uh, what's happening even in Halifax versus everywhere else, but. One of the questions is whether there is a danger, and I assume there's a higher danger in rural than here, but the danger that some small and medium employers will actually shut down completely. Do we have a sense of, of that at this point? And I suppose it, it depends on you know, what uh, policies and support is in place, but do you have a sense of that? Well, I, I th when, you, when you talk about a, a change in economic activity, of this sort of um, magnitude, uh, it's unprecedented, and, and that means there's just massive uncertainty in general. In fact, uh, every, every uh, quarter, the, the Bank of Canada uh, typically puts out a monetary report, uh, and they are, uh, usually, well, until this, they always have a, uh, a forecast of, uh, for for the economy to, to provide guidance uh, for decision makers, and this past. Uh, the report for the very first time ever, they didn't even try to forecast the Canadian economy. They said there was just too much uncertainty to give a credible forecast. Now that's a, a, a remarkable 
statement about the degree of uncertainty that's uh, f facing the, the, ma the macro economy and which filters down uh, to, to, the, to the local level. But one thing that is going to affect em employment levels uh, going forward uh, is that we've got an awful lot of situations, uh, employment situations where firms have a, a business model that isn't really profitable when you have to uh, physically distance. Uh, restaurants that have to throw out half their tables uh, ha just have, will, will have a, a volume of sales that is going to be half what at maximum what, what, the, what it used to be. Uh, people that did, depended on events like Dramagium, going to the theater, uh, sitting in an enclosed room side by side with everybody else, uh, only a certain amount of seating area possible if, if you have to have six, six feet between you and everybody else. So there's an off, as the imp, those sorts of impacts of, of uh, physical distancing haven't really been confronted because we've all been at home. But what, when you take, take off the requirement that people stay home, but keep the requirement that there's some physical distancing, a lot of businesses are, are just not gonna be profitable. Uh, and that's gonna add to the financial burden that they've already experienced from being closed for the last couple of months. Uh, so you have to expect there's gonna be a lot of uh, small business bankruptcies. Thanks, Lars. We have, uh, I'm going to try and group some questions. I'm, I think we have about 15 minutes left. Uh, there's lots of questions around what uh, government needs to do. I'm not sure, I don't know that you have the data around um, the CERB or the CURB or however people are using the CERB acronym, but what is your sense, uh, if you don't even have the data around what governments are doing to protect workers, uh, where the gaps are. I think, uh, I think certainly one of the things that seems to have been exposed, although it's an issue you've been raising for a long time, is that our employment insurance system has huge gaps. And now we have what could be some kind of replacement to that system. But if you can comment on the protections that you, you know, do you have a sense of uh, which workers are being protected and maybe where the the gaps are? Well, we, the, the government has uh, has stepped into the breach and there's an important lesson uh, that we, we can all uh, take from this. Uh, yes, indeed, uh, new social programs are possible and they can be paid for uh, if you want to pay for them and if you have to pay for them. Uh, now, that th was absolutely an, an appropriate uh, thing to do. Uh, it, when uh, when household incomes uh, disappear and uh, and so consumption evaporates when an investment disappears b because it, the world is so uncertain uh, and 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 when no foreigner wants to buy your stuff that means there just isn't any aggregate demand out there and the government has to step into the breach and provide the purchasing power to keep uh, the economy rolling and 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 that's with a a really remarkable speed. Uh, the, the Liberal government has, has done that and has demonstrated the feasibility of uh, something that is a little bit close to the idea uh, of, a, of a guaranteed income. And we're going to need uh, that to continue. Uh, we, we went into this uh, with the disadvantage, the huge disadvantage, uh, that we'd allowed the uh, uh, what used to be called unemployment insurance and which became employment insurance uh, to just fall completely out of sync with the times. Only less than 40% uh, of the unemployed got EI before uh, this, this came along. So we didn't have the sort of system of unemployment insurance that they have in like continental Europe where they replace um, uh, more of, uh, of uh, the un unemployed people's income for longer and for more people. So it's a much more, more of an adequate safety net. So this, like the deficiencies in our extended care homes, uh, this, uh, this COVID-19 pandemic has revealed uh, the, the deficiencies in, in our social safety net. And when you have a pandemic, you need 
both a public health response and you need also a, a social safety net to pick up the damage uh, from from the from the absolutely cataclysmic recession that, that you go through. Right, of course, and that is uh, one of the questions that is coming in is around the um, universal income or universal basic income. How do we fill in some of the gaps that, uh, you know, of course, people who have been falling through them knew they existed and and those of us who have been advocating for them to be filled for a long time knew they existed, but there we are. You know, my sense is, of course, we should look to the federal government to be the lead. And, and I think you can talk about the, how that works with the federal government being able to actually print money, uh, but that our, our provincial government has a role to play as well. And so when I look at who's still left out from the CERB, it's, it's, it's those who have the least amount of income, those who are, uh, you know, completely outside of the, of the labor market, but we had this arbitrary system that came in. So anybody who was unemployed before March 15th, well, they are out of luck. Um, anybody on income assistance has, if they have work hours, some of them have moved off, but that's a small number. And of course, those who have moved off are now receiving much more income support. So I think we, you know, we can see that the that the CERB itself is likely a, a better system than what we had before with employment insurance, which, you know, the hours changes meant that many more women were excluded from it, that people weren't able to access it. Um, I wonder if you can speak to um, whether you think there are other ways forward. Uh, some question is around, you know, the weaknesses in the economic system. Uh, are being revealed under the pandemic. Uh, still, some people are falling through the gaps right now, uh, even though Trudeau, for sure, is you know making announcements almost every day. Are there other um, policies that you think need to be coming into place? Well, I think you're you're kind of mentioning it uh, at two thousand dollars a month. Uh, that. Uh, is is a very useful uh, amount of uh, money, and it's significantly more than families on social assistance uh, were, were getting, or uh, senior citizens who are just getting by on the uh, uh, on the OAS uh, and and the GIS. Uh, so one of the things that, that this has shown up uh, is kind of uh, in, in a very concrete way is the inadequacy of those income floors uh, for for many members of of the, of the population. Uh, but I also I want to make, make sure that we 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 don't uh, get sort of sidetracked in when they saw uh, in in a sense by by saying that we can't uh, afford all this um, because in the current context we can't afford not to have it uh, if if there isn't purchasing power out there then. The, 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 there's nobody to buy the, the stuff that 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 could be produced, uh, and the and the cycle just goes down and down. Uh, so, you absolutely need this infusion of purchasing power in order to keep whatever aggregate demand is still going on in the economy to replace. Uh, the, so the economy, it's it's not just a. It is, of course, hugely important for the people who get it because otherwise their total their their household finance is just. How do you live with without without the two thousand dollars a month? But it's important for the economy as a whole that 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 that, that uh, spending uh, goes on. It's also uh, crucial that this doesn't preclude our options in the future. That it, we're not that we do not mortgage our future into a, a, a set of, uh, of of debts that are that are uh, accumulated during this period. Government of Canada has to run a deficit in order to keep the wheels on the economy. In order to do that, it has to sell bonds. The Bank of Canada has up to now stepped into the breach and like central banks around the world has bought a lot of those bonds. That means that the Bank of Canada owes the debt, owns the debt of, of the Canadian government. So when the Canadian government pays uh, interest on that debt or repays uh, those, those bonds, it goes to the Bank of Canada and the profits of the Bank of Canada go back to the government of Canada. So in, that, in a very real sense, 
the government owes the debt to itself and future decisions on how big a government we should have, how big, how large taxes should be, how large spending should be, they're not foreclosed by an overhang of debt which is externally held by the private sector or by foreigners. So it's absolutely crucial that the Bank of Canada continues to buy the government bonds that finance the deficit spending that we need right now to keep the economy rolling. Uh, this is a change uh, from sort of a full employment uh, world where you, you, the Bank of Canada doesn't need to buy the bonds, uh, but it's the change we need. Uh, and it's, uh, that's an absolutely crucial thing it, because there's, there's no reason why this deficit spending that we are now doing and have to do should produce some austerity demand down the road. Uh, we have, that's something we have to be very careful of. It all depends on exactly how the, the deficit is financed and it's a policy decision whether or not you finance it from the, by the Bank of Canada and the bank and up to now they have been and that's absolutely appropriate. Thank you. That is actually where I wanted to lead to was the, what you've been addressing. I was reading this morning that the Nova Scotia government does not have a deficit as of yet, which, um, you know, they've been in surplus for what is this, their, their fourth year. But considering everything that's happening, um, I find it quite shocking that our provincial government isn't, it doesn't have a deficit at this point. They say they may, depending on what happens with revenue. Surely, can we expect more of the provincial government or are you saying that this is really all on the federal government? I'm also thinking of our municipalities as you know, you look at, uh, I mean, right here in Halifax, we know they've been providing uh, free bus services, but that our municipalities have become so dependent on fees and, and um, of course, property tax, but that they are went into this with infrastructure deficits. Um, and of course, provincially, we went into this with uh, public service uh, inadequately funded, as you mentioned, around long-term care and others. So I'm, I guess I'm wondering what, where the provincial government is in, in this discussion as you talk about the economics of fiscal policy choices. Uh, uh, it's really the, the federal government that you have to focus on here. Uh, the city of Halifax uh, cut 1,400 jobs. It's uh, just this last week, they were going through budget cutting exercises through each and every uh, uh, department. They, they can't, uh, uh, can't run a deficit. The, the province of Nova Scotia can run a deficit, but it has to borrow the money uh, somewhere and it doesn't uh, have any power over the, the Bank of Canada. Uh, so the level of government that has to rise to the challenge uh, right now is the federal government. Uh, and uh, the federal government has to, uh, has to help uh, with the deficits uh, of the provincial governments and the provincial governments uh, have to uh, enable the municipal governments to, to continue in operation, not cut the services which are needed now more than ever. Uh, so it, it, this whole issue of, of financing, how to finance the deficit spending that, that we need, really bounces up, the ball stops, uh, the buck stops rather, at the, at the federal government's level. Uh, a related um, number of questions that are coming in are, are around um, our tax system and uh, whether we need some tax changes, uh, tax reform. I, I, I know that uh, CCPA certainly has had been looking at the supports that have been going to business, which had no um, you know, limit on the size of the business, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I wonder if you might speak to, do we need to be bringing in sort of the excess profit tax, which is something CCPA floated, or are there other issues that we need to be addressing now in terms of tax reform, making it more progressive, obviously? Well, I think that the, the broader question is kind of what normal do we want to return to uh, after this crisis? Uh, we've... Uh, the, the, this, this crisis, I think, will, will change, is changing a, a lot of perceptions. It, uh, re, it's a fundamentally uh, showing how interdependent our well-being is on each other. We're, we're hearing 
uh, the, the constant re refrain that we're all in it uh, together, the, the government has your back, uh, that, that's uh, a recognition, uh, an overdue recognition uh, of a fundamental fact of, about societies. We all depend on each other and we depend on, uh, on cooperation from each other. And that requires, uh, for its long-term stability, a tax system that people th think of as, as fair, that, we're, that I'm part of society, uh, we, we're all part of society, we all have to contribute uh, to, to, make, to have roads, to have hospitals, to have schools, to have these public services. Uh, and and are, are some people just getting off a little bit too free and getting a free ride on the basis of everybody else, and particularly if they are right at the top of the income distribution and getting a free, very free ride uh, and, uh, and flaunting their wealth as, as they go. So we're going to have to think, think about uh, what sort of normal we want to return to. Um, in the absolute month to month, week to week and day to day uh, evolution of the crisis right now, the, the key thing is to make sure there's enough purchasing power in the hands of the households that need it and of, in the economy as a whole. Uh, so, so, so we we have this, the, the the CERB. Uh, in the longer term, we're going to have to think about a, a fairer tax system, uh, but it's kind of a, a bit of a longer term uh, kind of issue. So, you don't think we should look at something in the shorter term that's a temporary measure around um, excess profit? So, those businesses that uh, actually are doing quite well, given the kind of change in consumption, grocery stores, and I'm sure others. Um, where there's been the shift in our lives uh, might have done quite well versus other businesses. And, and I guess related to that is kind of the overall approach um, from the federal government. When we look at the amounts of the, the, the support given, so the amount of money, certainly the amounts going to corporations and employers and businesses uh, morphs what has gone directly to uh, workers and others, and you know, is that something that we should see? You know, do we need to see more uh, going to support uh, workers, and, and in fact, not just workers, but, but but others who are struggling? To speak to what you just said, which is this kind of bottom-up approach. I mean, I think when we look at the amount of money, there's still way more going um, to businesses than there is to uh, people directly. Well, I, th I, I, I do think uh, we have to be, be watching for kind of smuggled, smuggled agendas. Uh, the, that, you know, when you've got this much uh, of a sense of crisis um, and a whole bunch of events going on at the same time, uh, there are all sorts of lobbyists up in Ottawa who, who want to cash in for their particular uh, agenda, regardless of what, whether it's meaning the the needs of the economy as a whole. As an example, we've got the COVID-19 recession happening at the same time, same time as there was a price war between Russia and Saudi Arabia over the price of oil. So that, that interacted with the decline in demand to produce historically low prices for, for oil, particularly for Western Canadian Select. Uh, and everything that's coming out of the oil sands. Now, it's not like they were making a lot of money before, uh, the, the, and the trend, trend in oil prices has been down since 2014, so a lot of those uh, firms uh, in an in a, in a actual free market economy would go bankrupt in, in any event, but they're going bankrupt a bit faster uh, in COVID-19, and they're going to Ottawa with their hands out uh, to, to get bailed out at a, at a time when we do re kind of want to think a bit long term sometimes about the climate change uh, problem and the problem of re reducing greenhouse gases. So we want to be careful about uh, other agendas that get a, a sort of kind of smuggled in and ported on top of uh, the need for a, a co meeting a COVID-19 uh, emergency. And we, we don't want to bail out everybody uh, that's going bankrupt uh, at this, this point in time. Thanks so much, Lars. Um, I see that we are actually at 1245.
And I'm going to stick to our timeline. There were a few other questions and uh, people have given me some ideas perhaps for um, other uh, webinars like this question and answer session. So I, I wanna first thank you Lars for your analysis and your critical insights today. Uh, very much appreciate you doing this with us. Um, you know, the decisions that are being made about the so-called reopening of the economy and how we move forward have to be informed by all this evidence. Um, and so we appreciate you uh, interpreting what that evidence means, understanding which workers have lost their jobs or most of their hours and how we can indeed ensure that the right policies are in place to support them. Um, and uh, that we don't really want to return to normal, but we actually want a better normal. So with all impacts, thinking about uh, even looking at workers, of course, all workers are not uh, feeling this uh, impact of the pandemic equally. So let's make sure that we have policies, ideas, and implemented out there that support and leave no one behind. We, as we consider having more workers go back into the workplace, I think we wanna make sure that of course, we're not putting workers in a situation where they are choosing between their own health and safety and income. So I thank you and I want to thank all those who tuned in today. We uh, will likely aim to do more of this, but just a reminder that uh, in uh, just under 15 minutes, uh, David McDonald, our senior economist in CCPA Ottawa, uh, will be on at one o'clock for uh, more question and answers. Uh, and so you can uh, go there if you have some more questions. Uh, David has been digging into this data as well and really looking at the coverage of CERB and, and what's happening. And again, you can have a look at all that analysis either on our website, that's policyalternatives.ca, and David's talk is on Facebook today. And thanks to Govind Rayo, who's the chair of uh, our research advisory committee, who was moderating over on the Facebook live stream. So stay safe and healthy, everyone, in solidarity. Thanks for tuning in, and thanks, Lars. Great, my pleasure. Okay. See you. Take care.